going to tell you a story today. The cool part is, is you're all in the story. Um, I'm going to read a lot of scripture, and I'm going to jump all over the place, so I'm not going to have you read with me, and at the end, I'll give you the references. If I forget, remind me, I'll give you the references to where I'm at. Um, And I'm just praying, God, that you anoint the ears of everybody listening. So I know sometimes when you read a lot of scripture, people kind of get lost in it, and I don't have that bouncy, happy, I'm kind of a melancholy reader. <laughs> so, and sometimes I stumble over my words. So, God, I'm just praying that you anoint everything that's said. It's caught by the Spirit, God, and it's not tried to be received in the natural. Um, that, God, your Spirit anoints my mouth, my lips, my heart to speak your word, and it anoints the ears of the people listening here and on the Internet, God, to hear exactly what it is you're saying. And that, God, you keep this flowing the way you want it, and you bring it across the way you want it to be heard. I just thank you for it in Jesus' name. And I told them here this morning, like, I, this is not really a personal message. Of course, you can, you know, God's word always works on every level. You know, he's, there's things personally for your life. There's, there's things corporately for us as a body. There's things corporately as the body. There's things corporately as the the body that has ever have been and ever will be, the God who was and is and is to come. So, but today I, I want us to look at more than just the personal level because I'm, what I'm gonna, the story I'm going to read to you is God's plan from the beginning to the end. And he's always had this plan since the beginning of time. We get so caught up and so worried about our sin and our little thing that's happening today and our little thing that we're not getting the way we want or God's not showing us this or that or we're messing it up. He's had this plan since the beginning of time, since before the beginning of time. And he doesn't ever deviate from his plan. And I'll show you that as we go through this story. He, 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 kept tell, he keeps telling them over and over and over. The whole, the plan is the same over and over and over. And so it's up to us to get rid of our plans and push our plans out and get in line. I w- when we were singing this morning, one of my songs is, God, you put your purposes for our lives in our hearts. What is, what is your purpose for us in your plan? Put that in our hearts as our purposes to, that drives us every day. I mean, you ha- everybody has things that drive them. I've learned that, you know, some people are driven by money, some by success, some by relationships. Everybody's driven by something. And God, we want to be driven by your plans and your purposes to end this current, present evil age, right? Okay, so... I love the songs. There was so much in them that went along. I didn't really realize when I was putting this to all these scriptures together how much this is a warfare, but it is. Um, and so the songs were wonderful. I'm going to read the words to this one because I just thought, man, this is so good. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the one who goes before us? His plan is before us. He's had this plan forever. He's gone before us and planned this out before the creation of time. Who's not afraid to fight. He's looking for an army to stand against his enemies that will display his glory, that will display his might. That's what this story is about. God has always been looking for an army to display his glory and display his might. Oh, can you hear the footsteps? Can you hear the roar? Can you hear the sound? We're the army of the Lord. Marching out to battle, we're marching out to war. Oh, can you hear the sound? We're the army of the Lord. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Nothing that comes against us shall stand. We will go forth releasing his power. We will go forth and reclaim this land. You know, God created the earth with certain purposes in mind. He handed the keys over to mankind. Mankind handed the keys over to the enemy. Jesus came, picked up the keys, gave them back to us, and said, here, it's back in your hands. Go reclaim it back again. There's your story. Thank you. Good day. <laughs> but that's the story of what God has done. That's, that's who he is and what he's done. And so I also want you to keep in mind, um, when we were doing the drums, he said at the end, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And, you know, Mike has said many times, Sure, we're going to have triumphs in our life. I just gave you a little testimony before we started of a triumph in our life. But you have to see the triumph of what God has already done and put in place. You have to see what the new Jerusalem looks like. You have to see the city that's, it's already there. He's already put the system in place. We're trying to reclaim it. We're going to go out and reclaim this land and bring it back to the earth the way God originally created it to be. So when we're shouting with the voice of triumph, 
we aren't necessarily seeing that with our eyes when we look around at the church, when we look around at our own lives, when we look around at the earth. We're not seeing that. But we have to see with our spiritual eyes that he already, we're shouting unto God with the voice of triumph that you have already done this. You have already done this on your side, and you're teaching us, you're putting your purposes in our heart of what we have to do to bring this into the earth so that it is seen with our eyes, not just with our spirits, okay? And I remember when I got the revelation that he really wants us to do away with all the enemies, that they, you know, this New Jerusalem, we read it, I'm going to read it again today, we read it last week, I think I read it to you, um, there's no enemies there. There's no pain, there's no death, there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no anger, gossip, all these things that God tells us to lay down, they aren't there. And I remember when I got the revelation, like, he's saying we're going to live in a place where those things don't exist. And it kind of makes you tilt because we don't know what it feels like to live in a place where those things don't exist. <clears throat> and that's what the triumph is. And then Terry saying prophetically, we won't resist where you're leading us. <laughs> I thought, you have no idea the story I'm about to tell, but that goes perfectly. We will not resist where you're leading us. He's been trying to lead a people. We're going to start out, well, I'm going to start out a little earlier, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Israelites leaving Egypt. You know, he's been trying to lead his people out of bondage since we get handed the keys over to the devil. He's been trying, and we're saying, God, we don't want to resist this. We don't want to go the way that everybody else has went. We want to go your way with your plans and your purposes. Okay, so as I'm reading this to you, I want you to keep a little bit of these definitions in mind. Egypt always represents the world. Uh, you know, when you're reading in the Bible and you read things about Egypt, that means the world. And I don't want you to think, oh, those people down there at the bar and their worldly ways as opposed to us, the church, I want you to think of the ways of this system, the worldly ways of this system, you know, where people get sick and cough and you go, oh my God, I'm going to get that. I, I, don't, I want to stay away from that. That's a way of this world. You know, in, in God's way, it's divine health. Okay? God brings us healing into the earth to, to help us to get through living in this system. But in his divine system... There is no sickness, so we don't have things like that going on. That's what I want you to think of worldly concepts. If somebody does you wrong, you get mad, and you take revenge, you get even. That's a worldly concept. Okay, we see that throughout the church. So it's not the world bar people versus the church, the people that go to a church building on Sunday morning. It's the world ways, the enemy's ways. Egypt represents the enemy's ways, the enemy's system, this fallen system that we live in versus what God says his system is and the way his system is supposed to be and the way he originally created the earth to be, okay? So whenever we read Egypt, we're going to think world. Moses represents the law. So, you know, he was the lawgiver. And when you read stuff in the New Testament, it doesn't say God's law that Moses gave. It says the Mosaic law. So a lot of that was mankind trying to put his own twist on God's laws, and I don't know if this is right or not, but I always think, you know, God gave 10 commandments that were pretty simple and pretty easy, and Jesus summed them up in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's, if you live by those commandments, you'll keep all the rest of that stuff. But the Mosaic law was hundreds and hundreds of laws that nobody in their own strength could keep, and it, and it represents trying to obey laws without the Spirit of God speaking behind it. So whenever we read Moses, we're going to think the law. The ites, they're going to be Amorites, Hypnotites, Hittites, Parasites, all kinds of ites. Amorites are warriors. A lot of these that I was kind of looking up a little bit, I'm not going to go into any of it while we're doing it. You can look it up yourself. I would really like to hear the teaching you did years ago because I've never heard that. But all the ites represent something of this worldly system, and all those ites we see pretty much in the church still, even in our own lives. I'm not saying we've got this, because we see these ites in our own lives, but those are demonic strongholds. You know, they're, they're places where the enemy has got in and lied, and you, you think God, you know, you're doing God a favor. We, I think we were talking about that scripture the other day, and you look at Paul was the prime example. It's hard for us to believe knowing how Paul turned out, but you realize before, when he was Saul, before he became Paul, 
He probably scared people just like ISIS scares people now. I mean, he was killing Christians for their fate, and then he was touched and radically changed. He was an ite that, was, that thought he was doing God a service, and demonic things had gotten in there and twisted his views, and until Jesus came in and he saw Jesus face to face and let Jesus come in and change him, he had ites all over in him. So God says in the story that we're going to overcome all these ites. They're not going to be in our new system that he's got for us. Joshua, that word means, that name means Jehovah the Savior or Jehovah help us. And it's Yahshua, and it means Jesus in the Greek. So in other words, he's a representation of who, in the Old Testament of who Jesus was in the New Testament. The promised land, it's a place free from all enemies. There's no enemies there. No enemies of God are there. It's the new Jerusalem, it's heaven on earth, it's the new system. The promised land is when we come into that place that God has prepared since the beginning of time for mankind to live in. And then I already told you Amorites means warriors. So as I'm reading through this, I want you to kind of keep those things in mind. And so I'm going to go back um, and start at the beginning where we first heard the promise, and, and God gave this promise first to Abraham at the beginning of Genesis. Oh, and I want to tell you, after I get done with this story, there's going to be a moral, okay? So I'm going to read the story, and then I'm going to give you the moral to the story. So um, I'm not going to tell you where any of the scriptures are at until we're done, so you're just going to have to listen. And I want you, really, God, I'm asking, listen with ears like I'm trying to tell you a story. And God, please anoint my mouth so I don't stumble over my words as I'm reading. Um, And this is where, you know, Abraham had taken and cut the thing into two pieces and made the sacrifice, and... So then it says, when the sun had gone down and a thick darkness had come upon, upon, a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant, a promise, and a pledge with Abraham, saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenesites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Raphium, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. And when you want to look at that in a spiritual realm, God is saying, I have given you everything of this world system. I'm going to give you that promised land. You're going to take all that land away from all of those ites that all mean something. If you look them up, they all mean demonic things that still pester us today because they've never been gotten rid of yet from the land. So God is telling Abraham, there is going to come a place and a day, a promised land, and your descendants are going to dwell there where there's going to be no more of these ites. There's going to be no more of these enemies that are going to be plaguing anybody anymore. So, you know, you'll read many, many, many times where God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I promise this to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I thought, I'm just going to go look every one of these up and say, so that's where he promised it to Abraham. And this is where I'm telling you, God's promises never change. His same, it was promised to Abraham. Then when you move over here, it says, and there was a famine in the land other than the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Amalek, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land which I will tell you. Dwell temporarily in this land, and I will be with you and will favor you with blessings. For you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. And I will make your descendants to multiply as the stars of the heaven, and I will give to your prosperity posterity after posterity all these lands, kingdoms, mine says, all these kingdoms of all these ites are going to be yours. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So there he promised it to Isaac. So he never changes his plan. Abraham didn't make it to the promised land, but he still gives the promise to Isaac. He never changes his plan. And then if we move on over here a couple more chapters, he's going to promise it to Jacob. And, and maybe you don't know, like if you haven't read much of the Bible, this is Abraham was Isaac's father, Isaac was Jacob's father. So it went down the line. And we are the descendants of them. You know, they were the beginning of our faith. They were beginning of the faith. You know, it says in the Bible that Abraham left his place and went where God 
you know, God said, go, and I'll show you a place that I'm going to move you to, more or less. And that's what he's doing with these promises. And that was, the, and it said that was accounted to Abraham as faith. That was the beginning of our faith. So we're the descendants. We, this, these promises come down to us that we are going to live in a land with none of the ites. And, ja- and this is his promise. Then he promises on to Jacob. Jacob left Beersheba and went down toward Haram. And he came to a certain place and stayed there overnight because the sun was set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down there to sleep. And he had a dream that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood over him and beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. I will give to you and to your descendants the land which you are lying And your offspring shall be as countless as the dust and the sand of the ground, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. And by you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So there it is. He promised it again because God never changes. His promises go on and on and on forever. So then you move over here, and now we're into Moses' day. Moses... Sorry, I could have printed this all out, but I got a new computer. I didn't have my printer on there yet. Um, and you know, it's kind of how it goes in our lives. God gives you promises like that. You're all going to be free of all the ites. And the next thing you know, here we move over into Exodus, and they're all slaves. <laughs> because the first thing that happens when God declares a word to you and gives you a promise, what? The enemy comes in and we sa- says, are we going to believe that? Did God really say? I've been listening to a lot of that kind of stuff. Where That's how he tempted Eve. Did God really say? You know, did God really say that he was going to give you and your descendants all this land? You're going to be free of the ites? Well, we're just going to put you in slavery and see how much you can believe that word. So, you know, Moses sees the burning bush. God calls him. He goes in. He gets, goes to Pharaoh. All the plagues come. All that stuff happens. And so then we get to the end of this story. And God is going to free these people from their slavery. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. Great cry in the world, because the people of God are coming out of her. People of God are coming out of her. The people of God are coming out of her today. Today. We, the people of God, are coming out of that worldly ite system that I've been telling you. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he, all his servants, all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, so there was not a house where there was not one dead. Think of that. We're trying to overcome death. Do you know of a house where you've not one person, you don't know one person in your family that has died? All of that worldly system has death scattered in it. Not one person can come up with a house where no one has ever died in your family. You know what I mean? I'm not saying a house like, okay, four of you live in a house and none of you ever died. I'm saying in your family line, in your household line, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, children, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, you all have, not one of us has a family where not someone has died, right? That's that nasty system that we live in now. He called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both of you and the Israelites, and go, serve the Lord as you said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and ask your God to bless me also. (laughs) Isn't that how people do? Like, I have resisted your God, I have resisted your God, I have resisted your God, I don't want you. And you know it was God's plan to take Pharaoh out and worship too, because you know Pharaoh was the leader of the world at that time, and had he switched and started worshiping God, the whole world could have changed at that point in time. That was God's plan. God did not make Pharaoh to resist him. When God spoke, it made Pharaoh's heart hard, and he resisted him. God's plan had been for Pharaoh to change. That's always God's plan. Always God plans for everybody. And so now Pharaoh resists that, resists that, resists that. Finally, he gives in and says, all right, go, worship your God. But would you bless me? Would you bless me? Just give me a blessing. I don't want to switch and and do what God wants me to do, but go ahead and bless me. Bless me before you leave. (laughs) The Egyptians were urgent with the people to depart, that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we are all dead men. The people took their 
dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. The Israelites did according to the word of Moses, and they urgently asked of the Egyptians jewels of silver and of gold and clothing. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they gave them what they asked, and they stripped the Egyptians of those things. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600 men on foot besides women and children. And a mixed multitude went out also with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. They baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought from Egypt. It was not leavened because they were driven from Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared for themselves food, any food. Now the time of the Israelites dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, even that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out of Egypt. There was a lot of songs this morning about the hosts of the Lord. All of the hosts of the Lord are coming out of this world system. It was a night of watching unto the Lord and to be much observed for bringing them out of Egypt. This same night of watching unto the Lord is to be observed by all the Israelites throughout their generations. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. And then it goes on and tells some other stuff that's, you know, all about that. There shall be one law for the native born and for the stranger or the foreigner who sojourns among you. Thus did all the Israelites as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. And I want you to realize here, what did Moses represent? The law. What did Egypt represent? So the law was enough to bring them out of the world system. The law was enough to bring us out of the world system. We were able to hear other people preach. We were able to read the Bible, maybe not necessarily hearing the voice of God at first but it was enough to start bringing us out of the world of the system. Keep that in mind as we go on. That's part of your moral. I'm giving you a little bit of your moral ahead of time, okay? So God delivers them out of the worldly system. <laughs> and we as Christians think, oh, whew, we said the prayer, we're saved. We know Jesus now. We're out of that worldly system. All is good. All is great. We're gods. He's going to give us what we want. It's going to be easy. It's going to be happy. It's going to be fun. Our marriages are going to be fixed. Our money's going to be fixed. Our health is going to be fixed. Everything's great. Is that what they experienced when they got out of Egypt? What happens? Enemies. Enemies everywhere. They're in a wilderness now. There's enemies everywhere. Okay, relate this to your experience. You had the law, brought you out of the world. You thought you had it. We made it. We've arrived. We know God. This is it. This is great. Everything's good now. All my problems I had in that other life, they're gone. And then all of a sudden, here start coming all these enemies, okay? All right, God, this is the part I really need anointed us because I'm going to try and read just sections of this that I've highlighted. (laughs) Make it flow. So this is Moses... At the end of all of this journey that they've been on, and they're getting ready to go over into the promised land, and he's recapping to them everything that has happened over these last years. These are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel on the east side of the Jordan in the wilderness. It was only 11 days' journey from Horab to the way of Mount Sarai to Kadesh on Canaan's border, yet Israel took 40 years to get beyond it. Is that not us? Like, we think that promised land that I keep telling you about where there's no ites, we think that's way out there somewhere. And it's going to be a really long journey because we see where we are. We see where we're going. It looks like a really long ways. It took them 40 years to get 11 days. (laughs) Isn't that what happens to us? Like, don't you look back over your journey and think, Man, it was right there. It was so simple. If I had just grabbed it that day, I wouldn't have had to put in this another five years, 10 years, 20 years to get that one little revelation that I got. And, and when it's so 
You know, hindsight is always better. It's so amazing how you can look back and see where God was telling you all the way along the journey and you weren't paying attention until all of a sudden one day, poof, then, then all of a sudden it's like boom, 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 boom. Everything he said to you, all that five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, it's like, man, he was telling me all the time. Wouldn't it have been so much easier if I could have just got it back there 11 days instead of 40 years? And in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the Israelites according to all that the Lord had given them in, command, in commandment to them. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in another hard word, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moab began to explain the law, say, Moses began to explain the law, saying, The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, you have dwelt long enough on this mountain. And hora means a dead, dried up ground. You've, you've dwelt long enough. The, isn't this world a dead, dried up system? You've dwelt long enough in this system. It's time to move on. Turn and take up your journey and go up the hill to the country of the Amorites. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them and to do their descendants after them. There's our promise again. He's bringing it back to him again one more time. He gave it to Abraham. He gave it to Isaac. He gave it to Jacob. Now he's having Moses give it back to the Israelites again. And we're in there every time. Your descendants. It's to your descendants. It's to us. Every time we hear it, it's to us too. And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all the great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites. We're all in the wilderness, right? On that place. And Amorites meant what, remember? Warriors. We're on the way to fight those enemies, okay? Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has said to you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Then you all come near to me and said, Let us send men before us that we may search out the land for us and bring us a word again by what way we should go up to the cities into which we shall come. The thing pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of each tribe, and they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us and brought word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God gives us. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And like God had given me a revelation a while back on that. God sends, I don't know if he sends people or we as humans just sometimes are able to reach into that realm, but we're able to go into that promised land, right, and grab things out. You've seen healings, right? You've seen times when you should have got angry in the world system and you didn't. You've seen times when God so overwhelmed you that his presence was so great that nothing of this world mattered. You know, we, we've all reached into those moments. We've all went into that promised land and grabbed some of the fruit of it and brought it back to the earth and said, look, look, haven't we? We've experienced that. We've experienced that here as a corporate body, all of us together. Moments where this whole body have went into the heavenly realm at one time, grabbed some fruit and brought it back to the earth and said, look, this is what we have to eat of. But then there were giants in the land. They looked at the giants in the land that they had to get through, you know, we can look into that, we get a little fruit from that land, and we hear that we can be free of all of our enemies, and all of our ites can be overcome, but they look like giants to us, and we look like what? Grasshoppers in their sight. And we think, we can't do this, God, this is too big. This is just too big for us. Then I said to you, dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Yet in spite of this word, you would not believe, rely, trust on, remain steadfast to the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place to pitch your tents by fire in the night to show you by what way you should go and in the cloud by day. And the Lord heard your words and he was angered and he swore, no one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give to your fathers, except Joshua and Caleb. Okay, and that's not God getting mad and saying, all right, since you all won't listen to me, you're not going to get this. It's God saying, here's the answer. Since you all don't get this, you're not going to make it. I'm trying to give you the way, but since you're not listening, you're not going to make it. 
Do you get the difference? He's angry because you're not going to make it because you won't listen. He's not angry at you like and punishing you. You're not going to make it because you won't listen. You see the difference? There's a huge difference in that. We always think God is this big, mean God that's trying to punish us for every evil thing because we don't listen to him. And he's a God that's trying to warn us. And he's trying to say, you're not going to make it because you won't listen. I want you to make it. I'm not punishing you. I'm not keeping you out. But you're not going to make it because you won't listen to what I'm telling you. Let's see. Moreover, your little ones whom you said would become a prey and your children who at this time cannot discern between good and evil. I thought that was amazing. What is the good and evil discernment? Where else do you find that in the Bible? The tree of the good of knowledge of good and evil. So in other words, your, child ha- your children have not grown up enough to decide to go their own way yet. Isn't that, that's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, right? You're going to decide for yourself what's good and what's evil. The tree of life is you're going to let God decide for you what's good and what's evil. Your kids, these kids that you said, they're never going to make it because we're scared and we're grasshoppers and we don't think we're going to make it. Our kids are just going to be prey to these giants. And God's saying, nope, your kids are going to make it because they're not listening to what you're saying. You know, they haven't decided that they're going to decide. I, God, have told you it's good to go into the promised land. You have decided it's evil on your own. Your children have not made this decision yet. Quit making it for them. Quit telling them they're going to be prey to the enemies. How many of us do that? We have ites in our own lives, and we think, oh, my children are going to grow up into that. Let them decide for themselves to hear the Lord their God. They don't have to grow up into that. They can let God decide for them what they're going to do. They shall not enter Canaan. They shall enter Canaan, and to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea as the Lord directed me. And for many days we journeyed around Mount Sirer. And the Lord spoke to me saying, you have roamed around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward. There again, you've been in this dried up place long enough. You see, there's what I'm just telling you. God tells us over and over and warns us over and over. Pay attention. If we'd pay attention, like we'd get to the promised land a lot faster. Command the Israelites, you are to pass through the territory of the kingmen of the sons of Esau who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you, so watch yourselves carefully. Do not provoke or stir them up, for I will not give you of their land. No, not even, not enough for the sole of your feet to tread on, for I have given Mount Seir to Esau for a possession. Where is that in the charismatic doctrine? In the name it and claim it. You can't have this. You can't have this land. You can't put your soles of your feet on this land. This isn't yours. Don't stop here. Okay. When you were in denominational churches and you said a prayer and you were saved and going to go to heaven, was that a land that a lot of people live in? Is that a land where you want to stay? Okay, so God said, don't stop here. This isn't yours. This is not the promised land that I've given you. This is not enough. Don't stop here. Keep going. Not even the sole of your feet. Like all of that stuff, all of that things that we were taught before that weren't right from the world system, whether it be in church or out of church, don't stop there. Don't even let the sole of your feet. This is not your land. I have not given this to you. Don't name it and claim it to be rich and prosperous and live like the whole rest of the church does. Like, this is not where you're at. None of this is yours. Keep going where I'm telling you to go. You shall buy food from them for money you shall, and that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them for money that you may drink. So we're going to have to live in the system, right? We're going to have to buy stuff. We're going to have to have food and clothing and money and all that stuff while we're in the system, right? So you're going to buy it, but it's not yours. We're not, this is not our, what is that? We're not citizens of this land, right? For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're walking through this great wilderness. He knows. He knows what we're going through. He hasn't left us out here by ourselves. For these 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. And most of us don't necessarily believe that, do we? But he says we've lacked nothing. Do not trouble or assault Moab or contend with them for battle, for I will not give you any of the land 
their land for a possession, because I have given it to Er, the sons of Lot, for a possession. Rise up, take your journey, and pass over the valley of the Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the people who are under the whole heavens, you sh who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Okay, now all of a sudden they're going to take this land and possess it because this is the land that he's given them. Do you see where this is going? We have to be listening for his voice. There's some land he's going to say, leave it. You're not going to possess that. There's some land he's going to say, okay, take it. I've given this land into your hands. And I didn't read that other part of that last story, but they finally, they didn't want to go up when God said go up. So they didn't go. And then when Moses came and scolded them for not going, they repented and said, okay, we'll go up now. And Moses said, no, don't go up now because God's not with you now. And so then they went up and then they got slaughtered. And it's like, because we don't want to listen to God's voice and we want to do everything in our own time, in our own way. And we let fear control us and we let other voices control us. And then we realize what a mess we've made of everything. And then God says, okay, well, I'm, we're not going that way now because that's already done and over. Now we're going this way. And we're like, well, no, I wanted that, what you promised back there, so now let me go this way. And we off on our own, we go again. And we get, that's why we go 40 years in the wilderness on an 11-day journey is because we keep going off on these side roads where God's saying, no, this is the way we're going. Stay with me and do this. And then when you realize you missed it, just realize you missed it and go back and try to find out where he is now. Don't go back and try to do what you missed because... You know, it may be too late for that. It may or may not be. Everything has to be by his voice. Everything has to be by his voice. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I have begun to give Sion this land over to you. Begin to take possession that you may succeed him and occupy this land. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. And the Lord your God gave him over to us, and, he, and we defeated him and his sons and all his people. At the same time, we took all his cities and utterly destroyed every city, men, women, and children. We left none to remain. Okay, so they're not in the promised land yet. But they're having some victories, right? We're not in the promised land yet, right? But we're having some victories. What's God doing? He's showing us if we listen to his voice, if we go the way he goes, if we do what he says, we'll have victories. And then... As we get closer and closer into the promised land, we'll be able to trust him because he's already given us victories and we've already learned how to hear his voice and we've learned when to go up and when not to go up. And we've learned when to hold back. We've learned when this is our possession, when this isn't our possession. You know, and he's brought us out of this situation, took us into this situation. He's had money for us when we needed it to buy this from the people. And, and it's this relationship they're forming with him so that when they get into the promised land, They'll already have some victories and know what they're going to do. Because, you know, even after they get into the promised land, the ites are still there. There's still ites to fight once they get in the promised land. Okay, so now I'm going to go over here. But I'm not going to tell you where I'm at. That's really hard for me not to say. Okay, now I'm going to switch over to this. So this, now we're getting to the end of Moses' life. Where, where they're about ready to cross the Jordan go into the promised land. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Neob, to the top of Pisgah, that is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land from Gilead to Dan, and all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah to the western sea. And the south Negeb, the plain that is the valley of Jericho, and the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to all your descendants. There's our promise again. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no man knows where his tomb is to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, when the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended, Joshua the son of Nun was full of spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. So the Israelites listened to him and did as the Lord 
commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none equal to him in all of the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and all the mighty power and all the great and terrible deeds which Moses wrought in the sight of all of Israel. So I guess I'm going to kind of give you the moral as we go because it, it's easier to pick up on as I'm reading it. So the law was good enough to bring us out of Egypt. The law was enough to get us out of the world. The law is not enough to take us into the promised land. We can't live by the law to go into the promised land. We've got to have something more. Okay, and it said, Moses, um, his eye was not dim and his natural force was not abated. The, the law doesn't lose its life if the Spirit of God is speaking it. Do you see what I'm trying to say? It's like, it's not that you put the law away and say, oh, we're never going to look at that again. It's that you take that law and you put the life of God into it. The law by itself is not enough to get us over into the promised land. But if you put, what did Joshua mean? Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, okay? It, it meant Jehovah, Savior, okay? So you take that law. He took, it says um, they did all the things that Moses had commanded them under Joshua's leadership. So they took that law, they paired it with Joshua, Yeshua's leadership, and then they were able to go into the promised land. So, like, just remember that. The law is enough to bring you out of the worldly system, to see it for what it is. You're going to encounter enemies when you get there, but it's not enough to take you on into the promised land. You've got to hear God's voice paired with it to bring it, you on into the promised land. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. So now arise, take his place, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land which I am giving to them, the Israelites. Every place upon which the sole of your feet shall tread, that I have given you as I promised Moses. There's where the sole of the feet came in. Like now God is saying, from here on out, everywhere I give you, you're going to own that. And why? Because you're no longer trying to take it on your own. You're no longer trying to take it with the law. You're now taking it with my spirit guiding you. So now you'll do it with the right heart, in the right way, the right places where I tell you to go. You know. So now you can take every place from here on out, every place you touch, this is yours. From the wilderness in Lebanon to the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, Canaan, and the great Mediterranean Sea on the west shall be your terror territory. So now all of those ites are going to be put under our feet, right? But it isn't really that simple. <laughs> we don't just to go get to declare it. We got to fight. The ites don't give up that easily. Joshua rose early in the morning and they removed from Shittim and came to the Jordan, he and all the Israelites, and lodged there before passing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp commanding the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being born by the Levitical priest, set out from where you are and follow it. Yet a space must be kept between you and it, about 2,000 cubic feet by measure. Come not near it that you may be able to see the Ark and know the way you must go, for you have not passed this way before. See, and there's what I was talking about the other day. Like, you've got 600,000 men, that just said. Not counting women and children. So we're in the millions of people. So here's going to come the Ark of the Covenant, when, and they're going to start following it. Like, to me, that's still, like, how's that going to happen? There must be something split in between them, and here comes the Ark, and now from the back, they start following them through the crowd. Because you've got to go through millions of people to get this to happen. So it's not like everybody's going to know at once, oh, we're going now. Think of that. Not everybody at once is going to know, oh, we're going now. Like, some people see the Ark of the Covenant passing by, and they start following it. And then you see the Ark of the Covenant passing by with those people following it, and you start following them. And then the next people see the Ark of the Covenant with those people and those people. And you see what I'm saying? Like, not everybody sees the Ark of the Covenant coming at once. Some people are going to grab a hold of it and start following it, and then the next people come, and the next people come, and the next people come until everybody gets through.
And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves. Separate yourselves for a special holy purpose, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took it up and went on before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to magnify you in the sight of all of Israel, so that you may know that I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest. And remember, Joshua was representing Jesus. So people start realizing, okay, the law worked to some extent in the Old Testament. Now they're going to start following Jesus because now, you know, when Jesus came, a lot of the Pharisees didn't recognize who he was. But the people who knew God and had the Spirit of God, they recognized who he was. And they saw that what was on the law, they saw that what the prophets had said and what was on the law was now being manifested in Jesus. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When they come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, they shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come near, hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you. Not the dead law, the living God is among you. And that he will surely drive out from before you, here they are, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Ha ha, I did good, didn't I? Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. So now take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And when the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan coming down from above shall be cut off and they shall stand up in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, And when those who bore the ark had come to the Jordan, the feet of the priests bearing the ark went in the brink of the waters, for the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. Then the waters which came down from above stood and rose up in a heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zetharan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arab and the Salt, the Dead Sea, were totally cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. And while all Israel passed over on dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. So there's going to be priests holding this stuff back. as the, you know, the, They were in the lead. The priests that had God in the Ark of the Covenant were in the lead, and they were holding back the waters so the other people could pass through. Think of that spiritually. You've got the people who are holding the, who are holding the Spirit of God in them, holding back the water so the others can pass through. Okay, and now this may not sound like it goes for a little bit, but wait till the end when I give you the moral of the story, okay? Because we're going to move into the New Testament now. Are you keeping up with me? Is it good? Are you getting lost? Am I like, okay. Six days after this, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on the high mountain by themselves. And his appearance underwent a change, in, or, and his appearance underwent a change in their presence. And his face shone clear and bright like the sun, and his clothing became as white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, who kept talking with him. Moses represents what? Elijah represents what? Prophets. So Moses the law, Elijah the prophets for the internet. Then Peter began to speak and said to Jesus, so Peter's getting excited now. Oh my gosh, I got to do something, got to do something, got to do something in my own strength. You know, I can't take it. Here's all of this. Got to do something. And, like, I heard it taught he wanted to build three churches. So you had the church of the law, the church of Jesus, and the church of prophets, and that's, they were all on the same level. So how many people read the Old Testament and think the prophets, everything they said was true on the same level as when they read Jesus and think everything Jesus said was true, right? But that's not right because there's places in the Bible where it says, like, the lying pens of the scribes, It says, anybody who tried to come up another way, which was the prophets. So they were trying the best they could with what they had with the law to represent who God was. But it wasn't until Jesus came that we knew what God was really like. And, yeah, 
And so Peter's trying to put all of them on this level ground. I've heard it taught that way, and I think it's pretty good. Um, Peter began to speak and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good and delightful that we are here. If you approve, I will put up three booths here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a shining cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am and have always been delighted. Then the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces, and were seized with alarm and struck with fear. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, oh wait, I already read the part I wanted to read. God said, while while Peter was still speaking, God said, Behold, this is my son, my beloved, who I am. Did I read, listen to him? I must have missed that line. It's right there. I missed it. So while Peter was still speaking, behold, a shining cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am and always have been delighted. Listen to him. So in other words, what this whole thing is trying to say is, you got the law, you've got the world, you got the enemy, you got your voice, you got your friends, you got the demonic realm, you got the ites, you got this situation, you got fear, you got everything speaking to you, you got the prophets, you got the law, you've got this word, you've got everything speaking to you. Here's my son. I'm delighted in him. Listen to what he says. Listen to him. The law was enough to bring you out of the world. You've got to listen to him to get into the promised land. Okay? We're getting close to the end. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still holds and is offered today, let us not be afraid to distrust it. Lest any of you should think he has come too late or has come short of reaching it. For indeed we have had the glad tidings proclaimed to us just as truly as they, the Israelites of old, did. We had the same promises that they did. The same promises that he gave to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That promise is still alive for us today. But the message they heard, they did not benefit them because they did not mix it with faith. What is faith? Hearing his voice. So they did not mix the old law with the voice of God. So it didn't profit them anything. It was there. The rest was there. The promised land was there. Can we say this rest is the promised land? It didn't do them any good because they didn't mix it with God's voice. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith by those who heard it. Neither were they united in faith with the ones Caleb and Joshua who did believe for we have believed for we who have believed do enter that rest in accordance with his declaration that those who did not believe should not enter it when he said I as I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest and this he said although his works had been completed and prepared from the foundation of the world from the foundation of the world it has been God's plan for mankind to enter his rest for he in a certain place, for in a certain place he has said this about the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from his works. And they forfeited their part in it. In this he said, they will not enter my rest. Seeing then that all the promise remains over from past times for some to enter that rest, and that those who formerly were given the good news about it and the opportunity failed to appropriate it and did not enter because of disobedience, Again, he sets a final day, today. Saving through David after, see, there's too much stuff in my Bible right here. So I'm trying to like keep all the extra stuff out. Again, he said, I'm just going to read it all. Again, he sets a definite day, a new today, and gives another opportunity of securing that rest. Saying through David after so long a time, and the words already quoted, today when you hear his voice and when you hear it, Do not harden your hearts. This mention of the rest was not a reference for those entering into Canaan. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak afterward about another day. So then there is still awaiting a full Sabbath rest reserved for the true people of God. 
Okay, that's not a people that God has set apart saying only these true people of God can make it. This is the rest he has set apart. Only those who are drawn by him that we talked about last week, only those that are drawn by him and moved by his voice. What, what did you say, Terry? Won't resist where he is leading us. Only those that won't resist where he's leading us are going to be able to enter into this rest. And that is set aside for God's people. The ones, anyone, anyone who wants to follow that and not resist. Anyone who wants to is God's people, are God's people. For he who has once entered rest also has ceased from the weariness of pain of human labors, just as God rested from those labors, particularly his own. Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter the rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief and disobedience into which those in the wilderness fell. That rest awaits us. It's, that's where we're going, right? That's what we're trying to do. That's the purposes we want him to put in our heart. How do we get to this place? You know, like... The key of, we've talked about in here too, the key of David is the same thing. You know, David fought all the enemies, and then Solomon rested from all of his enemies. No other person who had followed God had ever rested from their enemies, had ever fought to the end. You know, Joshua took them in, and they fought enemies, but they left some here and there. They made covenants with some here and there. They let some stay because it was too hard to fight. Some of them stayed back on the other side of the Jordan because they didn't want to go. And they didn't want to live in the land where all the enemies were. See, there's so many places you can stop along the way and say, I want to possess this land. When God's saying, not one soul of your foot is supposed to possess this land. Not because he doesn't want to give it to you, because there's so much more. There's so much more of a place where you can go where you can have everything that the sole of your feet touches. You don't want to stop back here short. But, but so many stop back there short because of disobedience, because of unbelief, because we want to do it our own way. We get entangled with the cares of this life. There, you know, there's the stories of all the stories of the seed that gets thrown, and this one gets, you know, the thorns and thistles uh, choke it out, or this one doesn't, you know, they're excited, and then whatever. You know, the four, the four seed stories. It's like there's so much stuff that can take us out if we are not letting him put his purposes in our heart and we are not following him every day, we're not going to resist you, God. We're not going to resist where you're leading because he's wanted this from way back there where he's... He's wanted it from the time he created the earth. But he started promising it clear back there with Abraham. And we read over and over and over where that promise is carried over to us. It's still here. He say, again today, if you will not harden your hearts and listen to my voice, you can still enter into this rest. Okay, so now we're going to go to the last scriptures. And these are the ones I read you the last time I did worship on a Wednesday night, I think. This is some of the God's promises of what is in this promised land that we're heading to. This wonderful, great place that he's promised. Like so many people talk about the promised land. Do they really have any idea what it is? Or do you just say it because everybody else said it? Or do you have an idea that it's, it's where everything goes my way? And I don't have to fight anything, and I got all these good things that I think I should have. Is that what we think our promise? That's what we usually think our promised land is. But that's why I said I want you to look at this at a big, way bigger, broader spectrum than just our own little lives. Yeah, this benefits us personally. Of course it does, because it's when a good king rules, the 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 people of the land are happy, you know? Okay. Of course it benefits us personally, but it's so much bigger than our little lives. And there are going to be enemies. There are going to be ites that we're going to have to fight. And there are going to be times when we don't understand. When they were in that wilderness 40 days, they did not understand. Why did you bring us out of the world system, out of Egypt, to make us not have food? We're going to starve to death. Our kids are going to be prey for the giants. All this terrible stuff is going to happen to us. Okay, we can't look at that. What was the bigger picture? The bigger picture was if you listened to God, you could have done that in 11 days and been over there in the promised land where he wanted you to be. But you had to fight your way through all of that. And most of the time, all the time, the fight is right here. What are we fighting right here that the enemy is lying about who God is and where he's taking us? Did God really say he was going to take you to a place where there's no sickness? No, did he really say that? Can that really be true? That has to be somewhere after you die in some other place because it can't be here. 
And that, don't you fight that stuff in your head sometimes? But this is the new Jerusalem. This is the city of God. This is the heavens. This is the promised land. This is everything God's ever promised. This is God's ultimate for mankind. Then I saw a new sky, a heaven, and a new earth. For the former sky and the former earth had passed away and vanished, and there no longer existed any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautified and adorned for her husband. Then I heard a mighty voice from the throne, and I perceived its distinct words saying, See, the abode of God is with men, and he will live among them, and they shall be his people, and God shall personally be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and no death, and death shall be no more. You'll have families. You'll now have families where there's no death, where you know there's, you'll have families with no death in it. You know how we read that back there? Uh, There was no household where death hadn't touched it? Neither shall there be anguish, sorrow, and mourning, nor grief, nor pain, nor any more, for the old condition and the former things, order of things, have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. Also, he said, record this, for these things are faithful, accurate, incorruptible, trustworthy, genuine, and true. In other words, I said the other day, mark this on your calendars, write this in your book, mark this day. He said this is going to happen. Whether we be a part of it, we're already a part of it. Whether we make it to the end or not, or death gets us, mark it. Mark your calendars that he said, today, if you'll hear my voice, this is going to happen. Somebody is going to do this. And he said, and further he said to me, it is done. It's finished. It's already done. It's going to happen. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I myself will give water without price from the fountain springs of the water of life. He who is victorious shall inherit all these things. And I will be God to him, and he shall be my son. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven final plagues came and spoke to me. He said, come with me, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And I had said when I read this other day, like, he's going to show you a big and mighty wonderful thing. You don't want the one that has the plagues and the infirmities to be the one that has to show you that. But he was the one that had the power to show you that. We're all, you see what I'm saying? You have to go through all that wilderness to get over to the promised land. All those affliction and plagues are going to be all around you. But he's going through that with God, not that God's putting it on you, but going through it with him, that's the one that's going to show you who the Lamb's bride is. Then in the Spirit, he conveyed to me a vast and lofty mountain and exhibited to me the holy consecrated city of Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God clothed in God's glory and all its splendor and radiance the luster of it resembled a rare and most precious jewel like jasper shining clear as crystal I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God omnipotent himself and the lamb himself are its temple and the city had no need of sun or of the moon to give light to it, for the splendor and the radiance of God illuminate it, and the lamp is its la- the Lamb is its lamp. The nations shall walk by its light, and the rulers and leaders of the earth shall bring it into their glory, bring into it their glory. And its gates shall never be closed by day, and there shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but nothing that defiles or profanes or is unwashed shall ever enter it nor anyone who commits abominations, unclean, detestable, morally repugnant things, or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are written, recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then he showed me the river whose waters give life, sparkling like clear flowing out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the broadway of the city, also on either side of the river, was the tree of life with its twelve varieties of fruit, yielding each month its fresh crop, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing and the restoration of the nations. There shall no longer exist there anything that is accursed, detestable, foul, offensive, impure, hateful, or horrible. 
Can you imagine that? Oh. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship him, paying divine honors to him, and do him holy service. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no more night, for they need no need for lamplight or sunlight, for the Lord God will illuminate it, illuminate them and be their light, and they shall reign as kings forever and ever through the eternity of eternities. And he of the seven angels further said to me, These statements are reliable, worthy of confidence, genuine and true. And the Lord, the God of spirits of the prophets, has sent his messenger to make known and exhibit to his servants what must soon come to pass. I was going to read you the moral of the story at the end, but I think we got the moral of the story, didn't we? (laughs) I said I was going to read you the moral of the story at the end, but we got the moral of the story, didn't we? You want me to tell you again? Moses represented the law. The law was enough to bring you out of the world system took you into the wilderness, it brought you up against enemies, it's helped you win battles here and there, it's, it's helped, helped you see who God was, who he wasn't, it's helped you to learn how to hear his voice, not hear his voice, but the law dies when Jesus comes and he becomes your life, he becomes the light, he becomes the illumination, he'll illuminate parts of that law to you, but it has to be by his voice. And that law is not enough to take you into the promised land where all of your ites get destroyed. All of of those things I just read you are no more. They're gone. There's a city where the the lamb is the light, where God and and the lamb illuminate everything. They, They shed light on everything. And the ites are not allowed. The ites are not recorded in the lamb's book of life. So the ites are not allowed in this city. And this is where we're headed. These are the purposes that God wants to put in our hearts of what do we do now? Every morning we need to get up and say, okay, God, what do I do today to fulfill the purposes in my life to make this come to pass, that we can move over by your spirit and by your voice into that promised land where you've been trying to take your people since you created earth. And the promise has remained through the years through the years, through the people, through the people, through Adam sinning, through all of the prophets, through all of the law, through all of Jesus and his day, through all of the ones that tortured them and slayed them, through all of our day with the lies and the, the shrouded thing of what it means to serve God, that all it is to say a prayer, his promises remain through all of that. And he will not give up. You can write it down. It's guaranteed. It's genuine and true that this will happen. There will come a day. And we're, we're a part of it. I'm not anymore going to say we can be a part of it because we're a part of it. We've already brought some things to path into this earth. We've already declared some things. We've already seen some things. We've followed his voice and we've changed some things. Some people are alive today because of some things of his voice has said. There's things in the earth and people that know who he is because of things that we've said. There's things that we've planted into the heavenlies that have been sprinkled down on people we don't even know that has caused this thing to go forward, so we're already a part of it. It's our choice whether we're going to see it through to the end or not. And he's accounting it uh, to us, unto us as faith because we're listening to his voice. Even if death gets us and death takes us out, he's accounted this to us as faith, and we're a part of this. And in, in uh, Hebrews 11, it talks about what we're doing mixed with what they did brings this to pass. It, That's really bad paraphrasing, but that's what I get when I read it is everything they did, everything the prophets did, everything the law did, everything Moses did, everything Jesus did, everything the people in Acts did, everything the church has done to this point has been a part of pushing this forward. 
There's been things that have tried to stop it. There's been people that have tried to stop it in the name of God that weren't really doing godly stuff. But in the midst of all that, it still has kept going forward and kept going forward. And God has never changed the promise that what we read in Hebrews still to this day, he still says, today, if you will not harden your hearts and listen to my voice, you can enter into that rest. So the promise is that he never changes his mind and the promise is always there for the eternity of eternities. So here we go, God. Let it be in us as according to your will. <laughs> okay. Was that like an hour and a half? I knew it was going to be long. <laughs> okay, anybody got anything? Really? <laughs> They're all shaking their head now. Okay, Father, just seal this up inside of us, God. You know, it's real easy to say all of this. It's real easy to see this with our spiritual eyes. It's not always so easy to walk it out in our day-to-day lives. So, God, you drop the stuff in us, God. You get our eyes set on this purpose. You let us see in our, with our spiritual eyes what this city looks like and let it become our driving force, God, of all the things in our lives that drive us Let this one take precedence over everything else, God, that your purpose and your plan for mankind when you created him, that, God, our sins won't become more important than it, our mistakes won't become more important than it, the things that we like and want to do, the ways of this world, the entanglements that we get ourselves in, that, God, we lay all of that down. And we say, let this become our driving force. Let your plans and purposes become established and let it become the driving force in our lives above and beyond everything else. And Father God, once again we say we love you, we honor you, we adore you, we prefer you, we esteem you, we refer to you, we prefer you, God. We notice you, we enjoy you, we love you exceedingly, God. And we choose you, and we want you to become our everything, Like, we can't even let this city become greater than our our relationship with you. Our relationship with you is going to make us be driven to bring this city for your honor and your glory. Not just so we can have a good city to live in without all of this stuff, but so your honor and your glory and your purposes and your plans and who you are can be established and what you always wanted can be fulfilled. We just praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.